Well, good morning and welcome to the Reserve Bank. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, Wellington day. Uh, with me I've got Grant Spencer, who's the uh, Deputy Governor and Head of Financial Stability, and I'm, I'm sure you, uh, you all know Grant. Uh, let me start off with a few opening comments and uh, then I'll hand over to Grant. Much of the focus of the bank's financial stability report is on the housing market. We believe that while the overall financial system remains solid or remains sound, developments in credit markets and in the housing market are significantly increasing risk in the financial system. House price pressures are increasing from three sources, from pent up demand, from supply constraints and the lowest interest rates since the mid-1960s. Housing pressures are especially strong in Auckland and Christchurch where the supply constraints are the greatest. House prices relative to disposable incomes are high by international standards and the banks are competing aggressively for mortgage customers particularly at high loan to value ratios. Household debt is rising from a level that's already high relative to incomes. Our concerns about the financial stability risks associated with, with rising house prices are also shared by the OECD and the IMF during their recent visits uh, to, the, to uh, review the New Zealand economy over the past two to three months. They're also shared by the three uh, main international rating agencies. The strengthening in global financial sentiment in recent months that's helped to lower bank funding costs and made it easier to obtain offshore funding has also contributed to our overvalued exchange rate. Reflecting our concerns around the housing market we've been developing our macro prudential policy framework. We've recently completed a round of public consultations on this frame framework and we will soon be signing a memorandum of understanding with the Minister of Finance to confirm the key elements of that policy. So uh, let me hand over to Grant for some additional comments. <coughs> well, turning specifically to the banks, um, while housing risks are growing, the banks have actually been performing quite well financially uh, with strong balance sheets and certainly their capital levels have been comfortable relative to the new Basel III standards. Going forward, we want to ensure that bank capital properly reflects the risks around housing lending, so we're undertaking a review of banks' housing capital models. And in the first stage of this review, which we've recently completed, we are increasing the risk weights applying to high LVR mortgages for the four major banks that use their own um, internal risk models. Um, <clears throat> this increase in risk weights will result in an average increase in capital held for housing of around 12%. Um, and this increase will take effect from the 30th of September this year. Um, although because that incre the increase in risk weights will apply to the whole book, it does mean that that will affect, we expect that to affect bank behaviour uh, pretty well immediately. Um, with regard to the new macro prudential policy, the recent public consultation has provided useful feedback on the costs and benefits of the proposed framework and on the potential effectiveness of the various instruments. Overall, however, we do not envisage major changes to the framework that we proposed in the consultation document. Um, in terms of next steps, over the next couple of months we will be consulting further with the banks on the details of exactly how these uh, macro prudential instruments will operate. <coughs> and finally, the bank is also making good progress in a number of other policy areas including the pre-positioning for open bank resolution. 
um, a review of the bank's oversight of the payment system and the implementation of our new prudential regime for the insurance sector. Thanks. Well, thanks very much. We're happy to answer any questions. With regards to the moves on the loan to value ratios, how long is that process going to take to be fully implemented? And does the Reserve Bank have any idea uh, what it would prefer around minimum deposit lend uh, levels for, for borrowers? Well, we haven't, uh, we haven't taken any decisions uh, at this point in respect of uh, implementation of macroprudential policies. Uh, what we've done is we've uh, prepared a consultative document and had a very extensive round of consultations. We've received the feedback. Uh, we'll go out soon with, uh, with a document which basically reports the feedback and uh, how we've interpreted that. Uh, and then we've committed to go out uh, and uh, consult with, uh, with the operational arrangements around the separate macroprudential instruments. Now, there are four macroprudential instruments that are identified, uh, and uh, consultation, in essence, has already taken place uh, in respect of one of those, and that's the countercyclical uh, uh, capital buffer. Uh, but in respect of the other three uh, instruments, uh, we will be going out and consulting on the operational uh, arrangements around those. Now, in terms of uh, LV ratios, I mean, what we've got is a, is a situation where if you look at uh, LV ratios above 80 per cent, they currently comprise around 30 per cent of uh, incremental lending. Uh, from the banking system. Uh, if you go back to, say, late 2011, around about October 2011, that ratio was around 23 per cent. So it's been uh, rising quite steadily uh, since uh, over the last 15 months, and it's currently around 30 per cent. But at this point, our next step will be to go out in terms of uh, providing feedback, public feedback, in terms of what we've received uh, from the first round of consultation and to uh, then go out with uh, operational details around the three other instruments, having already done it with the counter-cyclical capital buffer. So for mortgage, current mortgage holders or potential first home buyers, what message are you sending to them uh, looking ahead? They're going to need bigger deposits, aren't they? Well, as I say, we, we haven't made a decision on macroprudential uh, instruments uh, in terms of uh, what we might do. Uh, we want to go through this consultation phase. But, you know, we're, we're very clear that we are concerned about the rise in house prices and, you know, a, a significant part of uh, new lending, I think around about a third of new lending, is... Uh, is uh, first home buyers and a significant part of those, six significant proportion of those would be high uh, LV, LV borrowers. Are, are, you to, are you asking about the uh, application of higher risk weights um, or the or LVR, potential for LVR restrictions? Well, For homeowners, home buyers, given that this is yeah. targeted at, at, at the property market, um, they'll be looking at this and their, their immediate assumption is high deposits and that's what I'm trying to get some clarification around. We, and as you've said, the bank hasn't got any set numbers in mind, but I was just curious as to whether it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that's fine. So but what uh, Graham's comments apply in terms of we haven't made a call on that. Well, I mean, the, the other measure, the, the micro-prudential measure, is a matter of increasing risk weights on high LVR lending. Um, that will have some, potentially have some impact, we would expect, on high LVR lending, but at the margin. 
Um, there may be some increase in pricing for high OVR lending, some reduction in uh, quantity, but we don't we don't expect that to have a huge immediate impact. But we want to make sure that we do have the relative risk and the capital backing, um, you know, appropriate. Um, given the pressures that are present in the housing market at present. And this, this provides a, a, a baseline that will be permanent changes going forward. And that's the main difference between the, the change in the risk weights is a permanent change in the underlying microprudential structure as opposed to the macroprudential which will be on and off through the cycle. A ASB sentiment survey has house price inflation expectations at a, at a record high, exceeding the previous peak in 2003. How much of a concern um, is that, given the starting point that you point to in the document? I, I think it is a concern. I mean, you know, if you look at, uh, say, you know, if you take house prices month over month over the same month 12, uh, 12 months ago, um, you know they jump around a, a reasonable amount um, from month to month on that on that comparison, but if you take for example the last quarter over the so say take the March quarter 2013 over the March quarter 2012 we just get a bit more of a sort of smoothing out of the process, then you've got Auckland house prices up around 13 and a half percent. You've got Christchurch prices up around 10 percent. Uh, for for New Zealand, they run at around eight to nine percent, and if you look at New Zealand outside Auckland and Christchurch, it's about uh, it's about four percent. So a significant uh, part of the house price uh, inflation is occurring in Auckland and Christchurch, where they account for just over fifty percent of the uh, of house sales, um, and that's where the supply shortages are the, are the greatest. So. Yes, no, the survey, the survey is, is additional concern, in essence, in terms of future expectations about house prices. Well, well, given the supply constraints in both of those cities, I mean, the document points to the fact that um, it's the construction sector that says it has the biggest difficulty accessing finance. So the impression you get is that the banks are happy to stoke the demand side of the housing market by cutting mortgage rates and raising LVRs, but not, not willing to do much for the supply side. Is that fair? And what will you do about it if it is? Well, I think, uh, I think the supply side, uh, you know, the Productivity uh, Commission came out with uh, some good prescriptions of what's, what's needed there in terms of, uh, in terms of reducing uh, the costs of construction, uh, the fact that we tend to do a lot of customised house building and uh, that becomes uh, expensive. Uh, but there's also the key regulatory issues that the government's been uh, talking with the Auckland, uh, Auckland City Council about. Uh, and those measures uh, are important. I think the, the problem is that if you look at the supply-demand imbalance and you think about equilibration taking place through supply-side measures alone uh, of the type that I've just talked about, it really could take a long time for the market to clear in that sense. Um, and, and that's a concern. I mean, we don't want a situation where, you know, the country's faced with an overvalued exchange rate and with very high housing prices that uh, potentially continue to increase. On <coughs> just uh, following up on that, I mean, I think it, it, there is um, a bit of an issue there in terms of funding for property development you know, is one of those supply constraints. I mean, the, 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 the issues that Graham mentioned, there's a quite a long list of supply constraints, hurdles that we have to get across, and, and financing for development, development of subdivisions, etc., is, you know, is tight. There's no doubt about that, because in the previous boom, um, quite a few losses were made on property development loans by the banks and, of course, uh, more so by the uh, finance companies. And so they're, they're sort of slow coming back into the picture, but some of that funding is starting to come back now. 
and also there are other sources of funding for development such as uh, you know private equity type uh, funding um, so you know while, while we think that it is one of the supply constraints there are a lot of other things that are probably more important yeah, one of the one of the issues is that since 2008 when you saw a significant decline in the share of residential building um, uh, as a share of GDP uh, a number of uh, builders and developers exited the industry and so um, you've also got very substantial competing pressures down in Christchurch as well of course uh, two questions um, firstly you've got a, another warning about uh, or, or expression of concern I guess is probably a better way of putting it about the high exchange rate and and the impact it's having on on the slowing the rebalancing uh, and you've also got in this statement some fairly strong words about the risk to the system it, it, it's a much more uh, uh, strongly worded statement than your last one. I'm, I'm wondering if, if are, you, are you hoping for a little bit of collateral benefit in the exchange rate market uh, this morning? I'm not sure. The, uh, the exchange rate is overvalued, as, as I think uh, most people acknowledge, and perhaps significantly overvalued as well. I mean, the IMF, uh, the IMF when they uh, did their analysis, uh, about a year ago, perhaps a little longer, talked about an exchange rate that at that time was overvalued in their view uh, by about 15 per cent. You know, the worry, I think, is that, you know, you've got an economy here that, uh, in terms of other advanced economies, is growing quite, uh, quite significantly. Uh, you've got uh, commodity price linkages into Asia, where Asia is the Hole in the global economy that's growing uh, quite strongly, and you've also got interest rate differentials uh, that are higher uh, relative to the advanced economy. So you've got the potential for the exchange rate to continue appreciating, um, and you know that's a that's a significant uh, concern. But it's interesting that uh, that yesterday the Australians reduced their interest rates by 25 basis points. Uh, the cross rate uh, deteriorated, if you like, by about 25 basis points uh, in terms of the New Zealand dollar, Australia dollar cross, but that's back to where it was again uh, this morning. So, you know, it's not clear that, it's not easy, let me put it this way, um, to deal with uh, an overvalued exchange rate in the current set of circumstances. But is it a concern for us? Yes, it is. Second unrelated question, um, there seems to be a bit of a theme coming through here that uh, you're concerned that the New Zealanders' newfound prudence of recent years may be coming to an end. Uh, are New Zealanders getting a bit too complacent about their existing high debt levels? Uh, whether they're complacent or not, I, I'm not in a position to, to make that judgment, but, uh, but it's certainly true that uh, Household debt uh, as a share of disposable income is high. It's around about 140 per cent. It increased quite rapidly uh, since the year 2000 and before that, so it's been rising for quite a long time. It came back uh, a little after the, um, after the global financial crisis, but it looks as if uh, it's starting to tick up again. Um, so the levels are high. You've uh, mentioned that the changes in um, uh, capital requirements for high LVR lending uh, should have an impact on the mortgage market immediately. What sort of impact are you expecting? Well, <coughs> as I said, I think to, to Brian's question, I think it will be at the margin. We're not expecting a big impact, but it will start to figure in bank behaviour mortgage lending decisions now rather than September because loans um, <coughs> that are being originated now will be affected from September. Um, but you know it's, it, we, it's hard to put a you know, basis point um, figure on it. 
Well, because yeah, diff different banks will respond differently to the higher capital requirements. Some will affect more the pricing. Some might affect more the uh, their yeah you know, the the willingness to lend at those high LVR levels. The, these uh, changes would increase the average capital the big four banks will require by 12%. Uh, uh, what sort of um, scale in terms of you know hundreds of millions or more of, of, of extra capital are required and do the banks already have that capital re in their books so to speak? Uh, well that's right. The, the, the banks currently hold a buffer of actual capital over and above the regulatory requirement so with the regulatory requirement increasing, that's another uncertainty in the equation. Will I continue to hold the same buffer, in which case you know, that will have more of an impact. If they absorb it within the buffer, that will be less of an impact. Um, but the 12 that's 12% 12 on, housing, on housing capital. If that's a half their book, then that means an overall increase in required capital of maybe 6%. Um, and in, ter in terms of billions of dollars, I mean that we can I can work that out for you later if you like. Would you expect, therefore, the banks would have to um, r retain earnings, uh, i.e., reduce their dividends, or uh, actually go out, go back to their shareholders and raise capital? I wouldn't think so. No, it's not of that order of magnitude. I was just wondering if you can uh, sort of quantify the chance of the risk of the housing market coming to bear. I mean, it, it is a, a, a major risk that you're sort of citing throughout the report. And I'm just trying to sort of get a sense of, as to what your thinking is to, uh, as to whether that risk actually eventuates in threatening the financial stability of, of the country. Well, I think we'd, uh, I think we'd point to the, to the risk and uh, not make the other judgment at, at this point. Um, but what we are seeing is the second uh, quite significant uh, house price appreciation uh, in terms of the past decade. Uh, and if you look back at the house price appreciation that occurred uh, during the period, say, 2003 to 2007, uh, at that point New Zealand uh, had the highest rate of house price appreciation uh, amongst the OECD countries. Now that was driven by other factors uh, as well as um, as well as interest rates and supply issues. Uh, there was uh, a, a significant impact uh, from immigration, for example, and that doesn't seem to be uh, a significant uh, presence at this point. Um, and investor uh, investor demand uh, was quite strong during the 06, 07 period uh, as well. Uh, what we are doing uh, in, this, uh, in this report is pointing to the increasing risks to financial stability. Uh, and as I've indicated, the uh, international agencies such as the IMF and the OECD uh, also point to those concerns. I was also kind of curious, uh, you say that you're carefully monitoring uh, the ag sector uh, with the drought coming to bear and the likelihood that farmers are going to have to increase their working capital uh, loans for working capital, uh, still highly leveraged. I mean, it, it, what is that still the same kind of risk that you were thinking six months ago when you were citing the the, the amount of leverage in the ag sector? Yeah, I, th I think it is, uh, particularly in the uh, dairy sector, but with a segmented group of uh, farmers, if you like. I mean, if you look at if you look at dairy sector debt, uh, it increased from around about 11 billion or so in 2003, and it's roughly close to 30 billion now. So it's almost uh, it's almost a trebling. Uh, when you dig into the numbers, you find that basically half of that lending uh, is to uh, essentially around 10 percent of farmers, and that's where the potential issues could be. Uh, is there any evidence that the high LVR lending has been reckless, um, given what seem to be relatively low levels of mortgagee sales uh, in recent times? Well, 
I wouldn't uh, call it reckless, no. In fact, it's probably um, on stronger ground than the high LVR lending that took place in the previous boom. Some of that may have been described as reckless at that point. So, you know, the, the banks have their risk models and um, the risk models are reasonably sophisticated. They're taking quite a few factors into account. But at the end of the day, when you're le lending at higher LVR ratios, that is relatively risky lending, particularly in, in the extreme situation if we do have an overshoot in house prices that then um, turns into a correction the downturn in house prices that's been a rare event for New Zealand in the past but we've seen uh, happen um, in a number of other countries that have got into that situation of a housing market overshoot and that if you have that significant downward correction then that lending that's the first to become delinquent the high the high LVR lending so how big a a fall in house prices would start to become a widespread problem. I mean, you're talking 10 percent, 20 percent. Well, you know, when when we uh, the stress the stress tests we can you talk about. If you look at other countries, you know, some of the reductions have been, you know, 30 percent, 40 percent. And I'm not suggesting that that's necessarily going to happen here. We're talking about risks, low probability events. But the more that this market continues to push up above sustainable levels, then the higher the probability that you could have such an event. And just a final point, how overvalued do you think the housing market is at the moment? Uh, I'm not sure we put a number on that, do we, uh, Bernard, at present? Have you got any esti estimates? No, I mean, other than the same, when we look at metrics. What do I just you know, take the... I mean, other than to say when we look at various metrics like uh, house prices to disposable incomes or house prices to rents, uh, that the figures do look elevated both in terms of where we've come from, um, but also when we compare those metrics to other countries. Um, so th there'd be a range of estimates one could come up with, but um, certainly they, they all tend to point in the same direction. Um, the Treasury upgraded its, uh, the amount that the rebuild in Christchurch is going to cost. Are you guys going to increase what you think the rebuild is going to cost? The, uh, the Treasury estimates, I mean, they, they build in a couple of things. Uh, they adjust for the fact that uh, they're, they've moved into a, a new set of real prices, if you like, since the, since the earlier number. So that accounts for about, I think, one and a half billion of the, uh, of the increase. Uh, and uh, some of it uh, are reassessments around commercial building and, uh, and the like. Uh, I mean, we talk with CIRA a lot. Uh, we talk with the uh, insurance uh, underwriters uh, and various uh, other groups down in Christchurch. The number uh, 40 billion real, uh, that looks reasonable to us. Just a follow up to the question that was made before about agricultural lending. Given the drought, how badly exposed are elements of the dairy sector to financial risk at the moment? The, uh, I mean, the drought. Uh, maybe one of my colleagues can answer specifically uh, for the uh, for the dairy sector. But but in essence, if you look at the drought as a whole in terms of its impact on the economy, we think it's roughly. Uh, around 0.7 per cent of GDP or thereabouts. Uh, now you have seen, of course, farm incomes affected differently in terms of uh, in terms of output and farm incomes because of the significant rise in in dairy prices. Um, uh, but I think for uh, for as I say, for a group of dairy farmers, they are very highly leveraged uh, in terms of half of that 30 billion of debt. Uh, as I say, being uh, being attributable to 10% of the dairy farmers. As to something more specific than that, if any one of my colleagues uh, has information, then. Well, to, to <coughs> Grant. I'm, yeah. I guess I'd say you know that a lot of the um, agri debt, 
particularly in the dairy industry, is is quite marginal in terms of you know cash cash flow, in terms of uh, ability to service debt, um, because a lot of that lending has in the past been related to you know collateral value of the farm mm -hmm. rather than cash flow. Now, <clears throat> with the with the drought, a lot of that in terms of the impact on the farm incomes has been mitigated by higher prices. So that so in, incomes. You know, are not going to be uh, right now uh, badly affected. The risk is if you have a downturn in prices um, at the same time as the drought is affecting volumes, then that will impact farm incomes, farm cash flow, and reduce uh, their ability to service debt. And that's when you have a problem. But at present, you know, we don't have that outlook because there has been quite an offsetting. You know how uh, dairy prices have, have held up very well so far. Overseas, there's a debate uh, happening about um, how much capital banks should hold and whether they should be using the Basel risk-weighted um, capital rules or should go to a simpler uh, tangible uh, equity um, or tangible capital rule. What's your view on whether risk weightings still work and, or whether there should be a, some sort of simpler, harder uh, um, capital requirement? <coughs> well, we, we prefer a regime with risk weightings. We think it's important that capital holdings by banks should be relate to the riskiness of assets and not ignore the risk in assets. So the leverage ratio approach is really just hold the same amount of capital against every asset, irrespective of how risky it is. And it's a sort of a simple, you know, cut through the complexity type of solution and just say at the end of the day, you know, banks, you've got to hold some capital. And in the US, where there's a lot of complex bank banking structures, and particularly the investment banks, um, the, this idea has been proposed in order to just say, OK, we've got to make these big banks hold capital because they, they restructure their assets to make them look as though they're relatively low risk, which means under the Basel regime they can manage their capital holdings downwards. But, you know, in, in our banking system, it's a lot more vanilla, it's a lot more straightforward. Um, there's not the uh, securitization involved and banks generally originate an asset and hold it on their balance sheet and it's very clear to us what their risk adjusted capital is and what their actual capital is and, the, and they're holding actual capital. Um, so <clears throat> uh, we feel that you know the, 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 these responses offshore to push leverage ratio and basically move away from the Basel risk-weighted system. Um, you can understand the rationale for that, but we don't think it suits the New Zealand situation. And that's why, actually, that's one of the few elements of the Basel III regime, the, the minimum leverage ratio, that we actually excluded from our regime. So we, we didn't bring that on board, but it is part of the broader Basel III framework. One, one other point I'd, I'd make is that, um, you know, the, the, it's an example of what can happen with a simple leverage ratio is, is with the finance companies that looked as though they had good ratio, capital ratios, but in fact their assets were so risky and the capital wasn't adjusting for that that it turned out that the capital was not adequate to cover the, the riskiness of those assets. And just on the memorandum of understanding, uh, which you hope to conclude shortly with the Minister, um, it includes uh, accountability and governance. Would you expect to have as much independence in running the macroprudential regime as you do with um, monetary policy, or would it be sort of shared decision-making with the government in some way? Uh, the Memorandum of Understanding will uh, 
will indicate that uh, final decisions uh, rest with the uh, Reserve Bank, uh, but there will be a process of consultation with the Minister uh, in terms of uh, any moves that we might be considering. On the um, issue of actual limits on loan-to-value ratios, uh, which you haven't made a decision on, what are the factors for and against your, your thinking about with that decision? Well, if you, you know, in terms of um, loan to value ratios, there are uh, issues about uh, potentially about financial disintermediation. Uh, to what extent uh, might that occur? Uh, that issue is there by and large with uh, with uh, the other instruments as well. It's a bit. It's a bit like uh, if the government uh, if the government decides to raise a tax, for example. I mean, you get. Uh, potential avoidance around that. So the issue is, uh, if you uh, introduce macroprudential instruments, uh, is there uh, financial disintermediation, uh, and to what extent uh, that might occur? Uh, there are issues about, uh, you know, should it be targeted uh, if it were to be introduced at the uh, at the Auckland market or a regional market uh, rather than widespread. Uh, there are issues around uh, should it be introduced, if it were, uh, as, a, uh, as a quota or as a complete restriction? Uh, should there be some exemptions around, uh, around the introduction for first home buyers, for example? Uh, or should it be introduced uh, uh, as a speed limit where you uh, introduce uh, loan-to-value ratio uh, targets, if you like, for the banking system, and uh, uh, permit uh, that sort of lending within that uh, within that limit. So, there are some of the some of the issues that are that are around. But as I say, we have not taken any decisions about whether to introduce this uh, this instrument or what design it might take. Do you think, do you think that the um, higher capital requirements for those high LVR loans m might actually? be enough to slow the growth, or do you think that um, you might have to do more? Well, I think as, I think as Grant said, you know, the price impact uh, associated with the increase in risk weights on capital, which is the uh, microprudential measure uh, in respect of uh, the four banks that uh, have the internal models, uh, we're not expecting the pricing impact of that to be uh, to be very significant or very large, uh, but it is important in uh, building up capital uh, associated with uh, high risk uh, or more riskier lending. Um, but no, we don't expect the price uh, impact for that to be uh, particularly large. Well, thanks very much indeed.